If you love our crypto content or are looking to learn even more about crypto, be sure to check out and subscribe to our new YouTube channel after this video dedicated to all things crypto. Find new videos every week. Be sure to check the link in the description. Brad, welcome to Real Vision. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. We've been trying to get you on for some time. So much to talk about. Uh, just for those who don't already know, uh, Brad is the host of the Magic Internet Money podcast uh, and also of X Squared Ventures. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'm glad you guys could join me in my new place next to Raoul in the, in the Cayman Islands. How do you like the... Oh, they didn't put the pool table in yet. Maybe I'll go to a different room. Hold on. I'll go to the book room. Okay, now I'm, now I'm in the book room. I was hoping the pool table would be installed during this conversation. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. I don't have a pool table or a dog, so I'm going to switch to the other room here. <laughs> you know, those dogs are some of our most popular guests on Real Vision. People <laughs> love the dogs. People love Ral's dogs. Now, you know, for the longest time, I thought that was a fake background. Yeah. And then I saw the dog move. I was like, it's real. <laughs> yeah, lots of people think that like he films those at like a club somewhere in Grand Cayman, but that's actually his house. Adds to the mystery. Yeah, pretty good life there. I want to be Raul in a pretty <laughs> next life. Well, definitely. Thanks for bringing me on as a you know a Bitcoiner, a Bitcoin only proponent. I'm glad to see that you guys are taking that initiative to educate the the real vision viewers and listeners a little bit more about the Bitcoin perspective. Although yeah. you guys were one of the first macro. Uh, news sort of media companies that were talking about Bitcoin before everybody else. So it's kind of hopefully going to come back full circle where more Bitcoin content shows up on the platform. So thanks for having me on and appreciate the conversations we had on Clubhouse and then Twitter and stuff. Yeah, well, let's jump in and talk right about it, because I think this is such an important narrative right now uh, in the Bitcoin digital asset space. Let's talk a little bit about what that perspective is. I've been calling it the great crypto schism, uh, which is the contrast between uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoiners and everything else. Tell us a little bit about your journey into the space, your journey into Bitcoin uh, and your feelings about this, I think, absolutely critical issue. Sure, Ash. Well, so I I um I grew up on the east coast of Canada in poverty. So we we have we were on welfare, and I I was living in government housing and stuff like that. I moved around like twenty times and and went to like eight different schools, and I was uh in the in the Mormon religion at eight years old up until I was a teenager. So that was kind of like my early worldview was everything's a scam and. <laughs> You can't coffee is bad and uh, black pop. You can't drink that and chocolate's no good. You know, so I had this really kind of strange worldview of, um, I guess, what you should and shouldn't do. And and I was instilled with a, a different moral compass than most people. And when I was, you know, going into college, it, well, I had the choice whether I was to go on a mission or to go be a normal person and, and go to college and watch TV and stuff. And I said, I'm going to go do that. And so I went to Toronto and, um, you know, I started a business selling hacky sacks to try to pay my way through college, importing hacky sacks from Pakistan and, uh, and selling them to, to pay my way through college. And then I wrote a screenplay and I, I cause I was in a, a creative writing course in school and I really wanted to make this movie. So my, 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 I don't have a business background. So my entry into like the finance world or money or entrepreneurship was Googling, how do I make money online? And so that was literally how I got my- Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. I don't have a business background. So my entry into like the finance world or money or entrepreneurship was Googling, how do I make money online? And so that was literally how I got my, my, my lesson in entrepreneurship. So then I, I got scammed quite a bit and eventually I, I did start a business and 
<laughs> probably was like 22, 23, I started making six figures a month with my my bootstrapped game company. And that company ended up a month. Yeah. It went I went from basically being completely poor and hoping I can get a credit card for two thousand dollars that I can then change my name and, <laughs> and leave behind, you know, <laughs> desperate for money to to making six figures a month. And it was just mind blowing, complete mind shift for me. And I just piled most yeah. of that money back into the business and and started learning everything I could possibly about entrepreneurship and, and m- managing money. Right. Because it was the first time I had some money. And then, education. Yeah, it was it was great. I got to fill out all kinds of surveys and taste all kinds of health pills and stuff. It was <laughs> it's, it's not like anybody else's business business school experience. <laughs> but at the same time, it was around 2008. So it was when the financial collapse was happening that I was having success. And uh, right. I guess it was because people were distracted by entertainment and the video game sort of industry picked up a lot, actually movies and video games, people wanted to seek entertainment. And I was in that industry and we eventually went on to make uh, multiple seven figures with that business. And it was just like me and two other dudes in our basement kind of a thing. So we didn't have really much overhead. Wow. It was great. Yeah. I ended up going on and making the movie, which is what I originally got into the whole thing for because I wanted to make the film. So I wrote, produced and directed this film. But the business was What's like, it called, by the oh, way? it's called The Legend of the Psychotic Forest Ranger. It's a cheesy 80s horror movie. <laughs> it's just, it keeps getting better. It's rated like one star on IMDb. Like, <laughs> but it got uh, made. You got to do yeah, it. Yeah, I got made. I got it done. Yeah. So yeah. I stuck to it. So I spent some money on that. I built a house. And then I started looking into investing. And, and it was right. people like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a lot of doom and gloom newsletters that were like, everything's going to collapse. The world's ending. Get some chickens. Get some silver. Get some gold. That yeah. was that was kind of like, you know, my my entry into the financial education uh, media s- sector. I call that genre of newsletters uh, shotgun shells and Kruger and <laughs> yeah, apocalypse porn. You know, th- everything's going to shit. The world's going to zero. Here's the stocks you should buy. Like, OK, the stocks are going to go to zero, aren't they? <laughs> Why are you selling me stocks? <laughs> so that's. I guess, you know, I don't know why I'm telling you all this craziness about my journey. <laughs> this is great. But this just builds my mental picture yeah, of, yeah. of, you know, how I view the world and, and crypto versus Bitcoin and everything. Right. So it was, it was, I was going from thinking growing up that if you drank alcohol, you should go to jail <laughs> to following Ron Paul and seeing the, you know, the anti-war message that Ron Paul was spreading and right. talking about the Federal Reserve and and the problems that we have with the money system. And it, my mind was just blown. Like, I think I became a different person when I started watching the Ron Paul videos. I realized that the scam starts at the core of something that affects us all, which is money. And they control the money and they use it to keep you in debt and to devalue your savings. Because this is the first time I had some money in my life, um, any serious money that I that I needed to look at what to do with it. Right. And and I was trying to figure out what should I do? Should I buy stocks? Should I buy gold? Should I keep investing in my business? And that was kind of the start of my, I, I guess, more normal um, financial <laughs> education I was learning about the value of money and why gold is more valuable than than dollars. That's quite a journey. And so tell us when you about when you first discovered Bitcoin, what that moment was like. Well, because I was in the video game business. And I had a social game where we were making most of our revenue off of a virtual currency. It was, it was an economy game where I had a a million players. There was about a hundred thousand active players. We had a million downloads. So I had a hundred thousand people playing with this virtual currency. And I'm just some, some like ex Mormon, like guy that wants to make a movie so I ended up mismanaging my economy and I hyperinflated my game currency. <laughs> oh. So, and, and it was actually somebody discovered a bug in the code and they minted a trillion coins and it destroyed the value of the currency. So I saw firsthand from, from being a, a virtual central banker how, <laughs> how, how too much excessive money printing is not good for your economy. That's amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. So it was that, you know, the experience with the game. Plus, I was an, I'm an early technology adopter. I love to right. try new things. Um, 
I was trying this Arcos device back in like 2002, which was like, it was like the predecessor is this French company is a predecessor to the iPhone or had this mo- modular um, thing where you could plug in a camera or a, take it off, plug in a microphone. Wow. Um, so yeah, Perfect. I'm always trying, trying new stuff. So when, when Bitcoin, when I saw Bitcoin in 2011, it was just an instant, like, this is amazing. I need to get right. this. This is like going to be pretty huge because it's the evolution of gold. It's the evolution of money. It makes perfect sense that this is going to become eventually ten thousand right. dollars. So that was that was where my mind was at the time. I was like, one day this might be ten thousand dollars, which seemed impossible at the time. That was a sort of an extravagant notion. Yes, Bitcoin could trade at ten k. Yeah, at the time it was like um, ten dollars. When I first heard about Bitcoin, it was ten dollars. Wow. Actually, when I first heard about it, it was. $5 and then it took me two weeks to get my account set up and get the video cards ordered because I was mining in my basement with my video cards. By the time I got Bitcoin, it was 10 bucks. And then within two months that summer, it got it went to $30. And I sold half my Bitcoin thinking I'm a genius. I just made a 3x. I just made a two or 3x. Like that's amazing. I bet you often do the calculation of how much that would be worth today. <laughs> I don't re- I don't really ever do it because I I'm I'm not one of those people that like <laughs> sold all my bitcoin like I kept right. enough that like it's changed my life and right. you know I still want to evangelize it. I'm not like salty about it. <laughs> but if I had sold it all, I'm pretty sure I'd be pretty pissed off about it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I did a service, you know, for for a currency to be valuable you got to have the whales distribute to the new entrants so i just look at it like i was helping the Gini coefficient of bitcoin by selling it off so early <laughs> eliminating the inequality in the yeah space. you know I, I i was i grew up understanding that like what concentration of wealth does to people so i was like i don't need all this wealth give it away to somebody else <laughs> that's what i rationalized myself so that's a quick sidebar here i'm curious when did you discover real vision along this journey Real Vision, it wasn't until about 2018. I think it was 2017 or 2018. It was after the the the, the crypto bubble of 2017 when right. I had, because I was one of those people that came into Bitcoin for the, the activist mindset reasons, the philosophical reasons. Like I'm right. exiting dollars. I never want to touch these 30 fiat dollars again. Bitcoin is the exit hatch. Um, this is this is my way to protest this corrupt system. I, my vote doesn't count, but I'm going to vote with my dollars and like take away the power from the money printers to go drop bombs on people with my tax money. Like that was what I came into this thing for. Mm. And then I and then I and then my value of my Bitcoin was worth a lot of those dirty dollars. And I was like, <laughs> well, maybe I should take maybe maybe I'm OK with having some of those dollars. I'll, I'll keep some of them. So I started to sell a little bit of my Bitcoin just because I was reading books like um, Trend Following and Trend Commandments and Complete Turtle Trader and just all these different books about portfolio management. And what I learned losing a million dollars was a good one about risk management and portfolio management. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got to have some sort of semblance of like a risk management strategy, because if I don't, I'm just going to do that dumb thing again where I sell my Bitcoin when it's too cheap or... Um, I take too much risk on something. So I started to try, I started to try to like read as much as I could about a long-term philosophy and a portfolio management strategy and a risk, a risk management strategy. And I I convinced myself that like even though I'm in this for the long term and I'm one of those guys that believes hyper Bitcoinization is probably gonna happen, my my life is denominated in dollars right now. Uh, right. so so I need some dollars. So I'm gonna slowly take some profits off the table. And then, um, thank you know, thankfully I did because the bubble popped in crypto and and Bitcoin corrected down as we know like 80 percent or what, whatever it was, right? And and the cryptocurrencies corrected like ninety five percent. So that's when I discovered Real Vision. It was like, okay, now I've got some dollars. Um, what the hell is happening with the world? Like, why are the stocks still pumping? <laughs> shouldn't this shouldn't this be falling apart? Um, let's see what the, the macro experts have to say about this. So that's when I found you guys. That's so interesting. So you basically as kind of as a hedge, uh, and as a looking to explore and understand the where the macro world worked, the way the fiat world worked, uh, you came to real vision. Yeah. I was really looking at who are the experts in 
portfolio management and and investing. Right. And it was uh, Preston Pish, his Investors Network podcast. It was you guys, um, Eric Townsend's um, Macro Voices, and Kyle Bass, like folks like that. Like you guys were really great resources for me, and I'm sure a lot of other Bitcoiners that. We're, we're now finding themselves in this new wealth category where we've got a, a serious amount of wealth to look at managing and having it all in Bitcoin is probably not a great risk management strategy, but having it in stocks is an even worse strategy, um, especially with all the, the, the shenanigans going on with the interest rates and the quantitative easing and, and everything. And then the coronavirus impact on the markets. So yeah, it was like you guys were a great resource for for a lot of I think Bitcoiners who had found themselves with some new fiat, some new dirty bags of fiat from 2017, 18, and we're trying to figure out how to manage it because you were Bitcoin friendly, right? Like that, you set yourselves apart. Like you guys weren't like everybody else in the traditional markets that were like, oh, this is a bubble, this is a scam, this is just a bunch of uh, libertarians who think they're better than everybody else. You guys actually like Raul was really embracing it. Yeah, very early. I think that the first video at Real Vision 2014, first or second video, uh, Rao talked about Bitcoin. This is something that we've been involved in uh, for a very long time. Obviously, before I was at Real Vision, I was at uh, Coindesk uh, in 2017. I had my first uh, very, very brief uh, Bitcoin blog in, uh, I think we spun it up in 2014. Uh, it actually went live, I think, in 2014. When I can find the way back machine thing, it says 2014, January of 2014. That's how I date it. Uh, but I've been interested in this space for a long time. rao has been interested in this space for a long time. Um, and it's something that we've been passionate about here uh, at Real Vision for a very long time. And obviously, we just spun up Real Vision Crypto, a dedicated channel to talk all about this in November. Yeah. And I remember it was like, I think, Trace Mayer you guys had on your show 2015 yeah. or something. Yeah. In fact, we just had Preston on yesterday. Right on. Okay, so here, and this comes to the core of the question that we've been talking about, right? So then the space begins to diverge once again. Well, actually, let's go back to 2017. Tell us where you were thinking about the ICO uh, boom, bubble, and bust. Yeah, well, I was actually, so I did a bit of algorithmic trading as well. I was, we were, I had a partner and we were doing this um, Forex algorithmic trading strategy, but it was denominated in Bitcoin. So we convinced this bucket shop, basically, I mean, this, it's not it's not like they're a tier one Forex exchange, but they're basically this over, offshore domiciled uh, Forex exchange that lets you have like 200x leverage. We convinced them to allow us to denominate the algorithm or the the, the portfolio in Bitcoin. So <laughs> we were we were like, we convinced them to buy like 500 Bitcoin as well. We were like, just buy Bitcoin, just buy some Bitcoin. So they so they they added that for us, and then the algorithm was trading the Euro USD pair using this kind of like physics simulation model, where it was on really short time frames, like one se half a second or something like that. And so <laughs> we were doing really well with that algorithm. We were managing some funds for some Bitcoiners because this was like a non-correlated strategy for Bitcoiners who had Bitcoin wealth, who didn't want to just maybe say invest it all in a bunch of ICOs uh, and right. maybe didn't want to do some B BTC USD trading because at the time the books were pretty thin. You couldn't do like a million dollar trade very easily yeah. with leverage back in 2016. You'd move the market dramatically. Yeah. I mean, it was, I'm sure you could actually do it. It's just the way that our algorithms worked. worked. We couldn't manage much if we if we didn't denominate it in like one of the most liquid pairs on the planet, Euro right. Euro USD. Right. So we ended up making about a 500% return on that. It traded through the Trump election and that was our biggest night. It was like a 270% return night in nice. BTC terms. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, in, in BTC terms. But at the same time, Bitcoin was going up and... And then the alt season sort of happened again. And it was like, well, 250% doesn't seem that great anymore. It's like you could get a thousand percent just holding Bitcoin. Why are we doing all this work? So we decided to just kind of can that and just focus separately, individually on our own, uh, on our own things with Bitcoin. So I started to go to work for a crypto fund, actually. Uh, the fund was booted up around the middle of 2017 and I was on the investment committee. And so I saw about 
70 or 80 deals in the crypto space. So ICOs and seed, seed round stuff. We passed on most of them, but we invested in a bunch of them. So I was kind of like going to the conferences and meeting all the founders of these cryptocurrencies. And I mean, because I was in Bitcoin in 2011, I was, I was friends with a lot of the early Bitcoiners. I mean, I got my first, I got my first Ripple coins from Jed, the co-founder of Ripple. Jed McCaleb. Yeah. Yeah, Jed McCaleb. So, I mean, like I said, I'm an early technology adopter type of guy. So I try all this stuff. I tried Ripple when it was just like basically what Uniswap is right now on, on Ethereum, where you could ju- it was just like you issue tokens and trade them around and stuff. Um, I, I've i dabbled in a lot of this stuff in, in crypto and the bubble happened before. There was a bubble in, two th- there was a crypto alt season bubble in 2014, 2013, yep. 14 as well. And that was back when it was like Litecoin and Feathercoin and, um, you know, different random forks of Bitcoin where they're just pretty simple forks of Bitcoin. And then a couple of them were like different consensus algorithms, like somebody created their own consensus algorithm or something like that. And they would do an ICO for Bitcoin. So back then there was a lot of Bitcoiners that would trade these things back and forth with Bitcoin right? and, and make more Bitcoin. And it was kind of like, there was a there was like a Bitcoin maximalist um, sect of of Bitcoiners back then too, but it wasn't as popular as it is right now. Yeah, because back then it was more like harmony. You know, everybody was kind of understood that Bitcoin was going to be the winner, and Bitcoin was the big thing that we were all striving for to make work. And these altcoins were just fun experiments, and you can trade them for more Bitcoin, and you can either mine trade Bitcoin or trade shit coins and get more Bitcoin. That was kind of like the mentality back then. And it, then it in 2017, it sort of changed. So I, I don't think that a lot of the people that were trading crypto and launching coins and stuff in the early, you know, Bitcoin talk for, forum days were as well resourced as in 2017. So in 2017, we sort of saw funds like Andreessen Horowitz and and Fred Wilson's funds. A lot of these Silicon Valley VC types started to back all these projects that were basically just trying to redo Bitcoin, like like Zcash. You know, it was 21 million coins, but this time it's a pre-sale that only accredited investors can get into, but it's private. It's like, okay, you just, you're just redoing Bitcoin. So why don't we just do Bitcoin? (laughs) That was kind of the mentality. And we started to see billions of dollars get pumped into the ICO boom. And um, a lot of Silicon Valley investors started to invest in these projects, which were competing with Bitcoin. And um, there was so much froth in the market. You were at Coindesk, you said, right? So you're fully aware of that insane bubble that happened in 2017. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember struggling to keep up with it. We were all struggling to keep up with it uh, at Coindesk at the time. The amount of volume on the ICO t- uh, side uh, in 2017 was absolutely uh, stunning. And so we were struggling to keep up, uh, trying to understand the new projects as they were spinning up. Uh, and it was just it was just completely overwhelming. But it's such a fascinating story that you tell. That journey, the context that you bring to this is fascinating. First of all, I'm surprised to learn that you were like a 2014 altcoiner. That's a fascinating take on the story. But continue. Please tell us about how that sort of shakes out for you, what you begin to see, and how you start to think about what's happening in the space. Yeah, well, that, that's an important part of this that I don't think many people talk about. The, the 2017 period was really different than any previous part of Bitcoin's history. And even now, it's, it's, it's sort of different. And it, if you understand what happened in 2017, I think you'll have a more empathetic understanding viewpoint of toxic right. Bitcoin maximalists. You know, it's, right. it's, right. I think that's the key. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's really a, um, an immune response reaction by Bitcoiners to the threat of these invaders and these attackers and these like foreign bodies that are trying to come in and usurp the 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 system or the host. And I mean, my my metaphor may suck a little bit there, but you kind of get what I'm saying. Yeah. These these people come in trying to say, yeah, we love Bitcoin, buy our shitcoin, and we love Bitcoin, buy our stablecoin, and it's like they're just kind of 
um, aligning with Bitcoin in a, in a fake way. It's it's like these people are virtue signaling that they are into Bitcoin, but really they're trying to either just sell sell uh, subscriptions or uh, make money on their volume for their exchange or sell their own altcoin or capture volume on their stablecoin or whatever it is. All these uh, entrepreneurs and VCs are coming into the space trying to like disarm the fact that they're not really Bitcoiners or not really in this for the same philosophical activist reasons that the Bitcoiners are in this for. Yeah. And they're either in it just for the trade, just to make money, or they just don't get it. And they're just here for the for the hype. Right. So, but in 2017, the Segwit2x thing was really a, one of the huge um, moments that that cauterized a lot of the Bitcoiners to become Bitcoin maximalists, if you want to use that term. Brad, by the way, for people who don't understand the segregated witness debate, for those of us who weren't there, tell us a little bit about how that unfolded and what the significance was of making that modification to the actual core protocol itself. Bitcoin is valuable because it's, I think, and a lot of us think that Bitcoin is valuable because it's decentralized. And right. of course, it's because it's scarce. There's 21 million Bitcoins. Um, all It's fungible. It's got the great store of value properties. It's much better for transferability and transportability than gold. It's it's all it's got all the properties of money, but the most important thing that Satoshi invented and injected into the system of money when he created Bitcoin was the idea that you could have consensus be achieved to this ledger in a decentralized way that no government could shut down. Right. And and censorship resistance is the most important thing about a blockchain. And if it's not censorship resistance, it should just be not a blockchain. It should just be a, a database or or a company, um, a centralized thing. So there's a lot of these projects that are out there LARPing as decentralized, pretending they're all decentralized and leeching off the value proposition and marketing of Bitcoin as decentralized currency, like their coin is decentralized when it's not really... And Bitcoin is really the most decentralized thing that we have. And, and the reason why we know this is because Bitcoin survived an attack by itself in 2017. Right. So in 2017, the block size debate came to a head and it was more than just a debate. It was pretty contentious. And um, Jameson Lopp got swatted by some people on the other side of the debate. So this wasn't just a debate. It was it was pretty contentious. For people who don't understand the block size debate and why that sounds a little bit arcane, that sounds very technical. Uh, but the significance of this is it's really about uh, the future of Bitcoin. It's about scaling. Uh, it's about a lot of things that turn out to have real world implications for the protocol. And that's the reason why the debate was so contentious at the time. And for a lot of the listeners that may not be completely versed on the history of Bitcoin or what makes Bitcoin valuable. I think this is super important. It's one of the most important things to know about Bitcoin and why it's going to retain its value over time and probably, you know, win over time. And this is the, one of the reasons why folks like Michael Saylor decided to get into Bitcoin and trust the network and trust Bitcoin rather than anything else because of the block size debate resolving the way it did, because it really was an attack by whether it was on purpose an attack or not, like that's kind of up for debate what the motives were of the businesses and the miners and all that. It was an attack on Bitcoin's decentralization and Bitcoin survived that. So the two camps were, um, you know, Bitcoin was not scaling at the base layer. The way that Bitcoin works, there's only a, a very low amount of transactions that can be included in a block every 10 minutes. So there was a camp of Bitcoiners that were entrepreneurs. Usually they had businesses where they were doing lots of transactions. And or they had a like a, a casino on the Bitcoin chain or something like that where they needed lots of transactions to get through. And they needed to see more Bitcoin transactions be able to be processed every second because they would their mindset was if we need to compete with Visa, then we need to be able to process more transactions on the base layer. Which makes sense to somebody who doesn't look too deeply at it. It's like, oh yeah, of course, increase the transactions. That makes sense. Then it'll be more valuable. Right. And then you had people like Roger Ver who owned Bitcoin.com. And he had the number one uh, Bitcoin wallet by search engine optimization on the app stores. He right. was he was very egotistically offended by the Bitcoin developer community and the Bitcoin node runner community that did not value his ideas because he was on that side of wanting to increase the block size. And he was doing it as one of the early activist minded, philosophically, you know, libertarian, voluntarist minded Bitcoiners that came in in 2011 he was one of those people that that really did believe that 
Bitcoin should scale with a bigger block size so that it could not just, I think, because he could make a bunch of money off of it. I'm sure, that probably had something to do with it. But to be intellectually honest about it, I want to steal man his perspective. And he really did believe that his mission to have peer-to-peer cash be able to scale to everybody in the world would be more quickly um, accelerated by raising the block size so that you could have lower transaction fees. Because what happens with a capped block size is the transaction fees start to rise as people get on board with this thing and want some of it and want to use it. Because then you develop a fee market develops where you have to bid higher and higher prices to get your transaction included in a block. So Coinbase was on the side of big blocks. Um, Bitmain was on the side of big blocks. Roger Ver, who owned Bitcoin.com, was on the side of big blocks. Pretty much 70% of the miners and businesses that controlled most of the um, clout or weight, whatever, in, in, that, in the, um, I guess, the, the VC world and, and the entrepreneur and, and miner world, it was pretty much the corporations versus the developers and the users and the node runners. And most of the corporations wanted to scale it in a way that would allow their businesses to keep growing and allow them to keep their mission going for Bitcoin and their vision for Bitcoin going without having to invest the development resources on their end to make their usage of Bitcoin more efficient. So for example, Coinbase wasn't batching transactions and they were making no effort to want to use SegWit to be more efficient with the block space. So there's there's two there's two fundamental things here that Bitcoiners, our perspective was that we don't want to see Bitcoin be taken over or influenced by corporations in a way that's not in consensus with what the node runners and the developers of this network want. Because if we just give in to let corporations, because they've got all the money, set the rules of Bitcoin, what's that precedent setting for governments if they decide to turn against this thing? And you know, we saw in 1933 with Executive Order 6102 when right. Franklin Roosevelt issued the ban on uh, private ownership of gold, that that's not off the table. So why why make it easy for a government to just say, oh, well, Bitcoin's banned. And now we saw you change Bitcoin in 2017 for these companies. So change it again for us. Otherwise, you're going to jail. <laughs> you know, right. That was one of the core tenets of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoiners back then was like it's decentralization is most important and that has to be retained above everything else, even the price and adoption and everything. See, this is such an important bit of history, I think, for the Bitcoin space for people who don't already know it. I know it gets a little technical. I know it gets a little down into the weeds, uh, but this was a very complex multi-party debate. Uh, You had corporations, you had people who were in it, uh, the Bitcoin space uh, for ideological and philosophical reasons. You had miners and node runners. It's a very complex uh, debate between a lot of different parties. Tell us more about where you came down on that debate and why. Yeah, well, actually, the I say like the only time I ever kind of felt scared for Bitcoin was was about November 2017. From 2011 until now, I mean, that was the only time I felt like this may not work. This this might fail because there was such a huge juggernaut of of um, an opposition there. These guys literally controlled the majority of all the resources. And you had people like Bitmain saying, like, we've got $100 million and we're just going to fork Bitcoin and destroy it and do a chainsaw account- attack. You had Roger Ver, who owned the domain, Bitcoin.com, saying he was going to stop supporting Bitcoin. He was going to start supporting Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, which was, you know, later became Bitcoin Cash. Right. So, so literally you had like Coinbase, the number one exchange, saying... Bitcoin is pretty much dead. The developers killed it and we're going to start supporting Ethereum and, you know, all these altcoins and we don't care about Bitcoin anymore. So these guys had, for me, like most Bitcoiners, like, you know, really hardcore Bitcoiners weren't afraid of it. They were just like, come on, bring it on. But I'm more like, um, uh, uh, um, I like to think of myself as like a good, put, put myself in the shoes of somebody else and have a marketer's mindset and like a product mindset. And I was just looking at this saying like, You know, of course, I'm on that small block side and I'm arguing constantly on Twitter and I'm spending way too much of my time debating and like trying to push forward this narrative of, uh, you know, we don't want Segwit2x. We need to keep Bitcoin decentralized and we need to um, scale it out on second layers with Lightning Network and be more efficient with our usage of Bitcoin so that we we keep the fees. um, We sorry, we keep the block size low so that we scale it, scale it out um, by 
compressing transactions on the base layer and then putting the extra stuff on second layers and side chains. Right. But I was looking at it like, okay, well, we've got the biggest exchange, the biggest miner, all the companies that own the the Google search terms for Bitcoin are all on this other side. This is a pretty ins- like insurmountable mountain yeah. we've got to climb. I, I remember, by the way, in, in those days, and it, I remember that debate. I remember scaling it up. And I remember guys who had been like vintage 2010, vintage 2011 mm-hmm. saying to me, this might be it. I mean, it's hard to <laughs> believe now, but there were people in 2017 who were smart and they were in the space for a long time who thought it might all come tumbling down. Well, a lot of those folks ended up becoming shit coiners as like colloquially <laughs> or not <laughs> or they or they became bitcoin maximalists and they were angry about the fact that they saw that that big corporations were trying to blow it up in their view so it was people on both sides of the debate who really thought this was this was an, this was the closest i would say bitcoin's come to an existential crisis in my time in the space certainly oh for sure and it's the only cryptocurrency that's ever had this level of an attack. So that's why a lot of us say like this, these other coins, Ethereum and all these other coins, they are not decentralized in a way that matters and in a way that's going to be government resistant if it ever comes to that. So yeah. they all like to claim they're decentralized, but Bitcoin's the only cryptocurrency that's ever had that test where it's had to face the first level boss, which is itself. I mean, in 2013, or, you know, they we had to face regulators from New York and and like the Bitcoin exchanges were going getting um, harassed, like Charlie Shrem got arrested and, you know, Bitcoiners were being attacked. Bitcoin, they were trying to attack Bitcoin. So we kind of had a regulatory. We saw what, what a re- regulatory attack looked like in 2013. But in an interview, I think it was even on Real Vision where Katie Hahn, who's the lead prosecutor for the Silk Road case, said that. Her, her bosses at, in New York were like, go after Bitcoin. We need you to take Bitcoin down. And she quickly realized, well, you can't stop Bitcoin. So then they said, well, go after the businesses, find out who's doing the Silk Road thing and go after anybody who's in, involved in that. So then she started to sort of like focus on that. We, we saw, the, so that was part one. We saw, okay, well, the regulators sort of missed their opportunity, I think, to really attack Bitcoin. They could have in 2013, 14, it was kind of fragile enough back then. They could have stamped it out. But then in 2017, if we had to give it in and we had to let Coinbase and all these corporations have their way and control, take control over Bitcoin, then I think it might be much easier for people like Mike Green to get their wish and have the governments come in and, and shut Bitcoin down because we would have I mean, Mike, failed Mike that claims test. that's not what he wants. His claim is that he believes that's what's going to happen just to... Point of clarity. Oh, I know. I know what he claims. I know what he claims. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what he thinks too. He's he's salty, man. He just doesn't want Bitcoin to win. So he's like, yeah, no, I'm all for freedom. I'm for liberty. Just shut that Bitcoin thing down. That's all. <laughs> we just don't want that Bitcoin thing. That freedom providing Bitcoin thing. We don't want that. I suspect if Mike were here, he would probably have a different take. Oh yeah. Well, see, he he talks differently to Bitcoiners. Than he does to altcoiners, or sorry, to uh, to traditional fiat people. I've watched a bunch of interviews with him recently, and he he really lets his real um, vision through when he's talking to someone who's not a bitcoiner. When he's talking to a bitcoiner, he's kind of like diplomatic and chooses his words carefully. But when he talks to another person who's not into bitcoin, he calls us like financial terrorists and like you know ridiculous things. Like, oh, we're gonna we're we're the same as the people who are gonna attack the capital. You know, it's those people in Bitcoin and Antifa and Bitcoin. And it's like, okay, man. All right. All right. Since Mike's not here to defend himself, uh, let's move on and but keep going in the conversation because this is really interesting. Look, you know, in in for those who don't know and who aren't, you know, weren't here at the time, uh, in August of 2017, I think it was August, summer of 2017, uh, the soft fork, fork occurs uh, in Bitcoin. You get the split uh, between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, BCH, uh, obviously still around, still trading. Uh, but continue on with that story. Actually, talking about Mike Green, it makes sense because uh, we can loop this in because Mike has this philosophy and or this this idea that governments can um, empty block attack Bitcoin, and I don't think that he's he's kind of like doesn't understand it enough with his empty block thesis, but there is something that could happen, and it almost happened in 2017, which is a chain stall attack, and 
that's what what I was most worried about in 2017 because when the fork happened and Bitcoin Cash split off and a, the biggest miner Bitmain and went off and started to support Bitcoin Cash and you had one of the biggest funds in Japan um, go and support Bitcoin Cash and um, there was a lot of early Bitcoin people that were like they had they had been following Roger for so long and they kind of just followed him to Bitcoin Cash. So a lo- there was a bunch of economic weight that went to Bitcoin Cash and a bunch of mining. And they were using, so this is where it gets a little bit complex, but there was like this two month period where there was now Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. They used the same mining algorithm. So th- there was a big miner that was saying that they were going to support Bitcoin Cash. And the guy that owned Bitcoin.com was going to replace Bitcoin with Bitcoin Cash. And he also had a bunch of mining power. And then there was... Um, this Segwit2x thing, which was like the corporate version of Bitcoin, where they wanted to say BitGo and Coinbase and their New York agreement was all these hundred prominent Bitcoin companies that were going to support this Segwit2x coin. And then you had all the node runners, the like hundred thousand nodes that that are you know full nodes running Bitcoin, and all the developers were on the other side of the Segwit2x thing. So you had really Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Segwit2x. And in November 2017, they were planning to fork Bitcoin and all the exchanges were going to just point from Bitcoin to Segwit to Xcoin, which would have been now Bitcoin in their eyes. So then all of us that were just valuing Bitcoin and running the nodes for Bitcoin, were just going to stay on Bitcoin and there was going to be two Bitcoins, one that was run by the developers and the users and one that was run by the businesses that were onboarding a million or so new users. So that is what we were facing. And then you had in the middle, Roger Ver, who was just waiting to see if he was going to support Segwit2x or Bitcoin Cash. He definitely wasn't going to support Bitcoin. So you had a lot of like, <laughs> it was really scary. And we had Bitfinex actually, thankfully, on our side as bit, as early Bitcoiners. They put up a futures market so that you could just put your money where your mouth was and bet on the price of Bitcoin or Segwit2x coin. And so like people like Adam Back and folks were really vocal on, on Bitcoin Twitter talking about how they're their trades were going and like uh, making predictions of the price of Segwit2x coin. And we saw the market sort of proved out that the the consensus was that Bitcoin was going to win and that Segwit2x coin was a a shit coin and it was not going to be supported. And it was going to cause a lot of losses. And all of us Bitcoin maximalist folks were really willing to do scorched earth and just see the value of everything go to zero because we would rather retain the properties of decentralization, censorship resistance, um, sovereignty, and all of the ability to run a node for anybody in the world than see some like corporate version of Bitcoin take over just to save them some development resources and keep the fees low for the sake of adoption. So we're thinking in longer timeframes. But the, 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 the chain stall attack almost happened because all the Bitcoin miners sort of like piled on to Bitcoin and they added more difficulty on Bitcoin. So when you add more mining power on Bitcoin, it the difficulty adjustment is one of the genius game theory things about Bitcoin and why it can stay decentralized. The difficulty adjustment changes based on the amount of hash power. And there's this period of time where it takes for a new difficulty adjustment to happen. So right before the Segwit2x was about to happen, all this new hash power started to come onto Bitcoin and it raised the difficulty up. So what the chainsaw attack is, is that adding a ton of hash power, getting the difficulty readjusted to a much higher position, and then taking all your hash power away from it and putting it on Bitcoin Cash or the Segwit2x coin. Roger Ver was pumping up this thing. Like everybody was promoting Segwit2x coin. The miners were adding hash power to Bitcoin. And the idea was that then when Segwit2x fork happened, they were going to take all their hash power away from the BTC that us, like the users and the developers were using and put it onto this new coin. And then that would stall the chain so that we wouldn't have a block for like a month because it would there wouldn't be enough hash power to get the difficulty readjusted down. And you'd see blocks slowing down to like a day, two days between blocks. And that would kind of stall the chain. I know this is a highly technical debate for some of our uh, for some of our viewers, but the idea is that the game theory uh, point that Brad was just talking about is as new hash power comes online for Bitcoin, the difficulty adjustment, which is the the mechanism in the proof uh, of work uh, consensus mechanism, adjusts to compensate for the hash power. Uh, and this was the, a mechanism that was potentially uh, going to be used to uh, kind of 
game the system so that there would be empty, there wouldn't be a block that would be minted for a significant period of time. Uh, and that would have been obviously quite negative for the original Bitcoin network. Yeah, and it was the closest that it would ever have been possible to accomplish this attack in 2017, November 2017, because of all the elements that lined up. It's it's only because they ended up calling it off. They made the right decision. Um, they ended up calling it off. They saw that this was going to actually be pretty disruptive to 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 not just Bitcoin but cryptocurrency and their businesses in general. And a lot of these guys have, you know, a lot of uh, most of their economic weight is into cryptocurrencies. And I think they all realize pretty, pretty much that if they destroy Bitcoin, it's going to destroy cryptocurrency and it's going to show that like this thing is a failed experiment. So why are we going to do this other fake Bitcoin? You know, Bitcoin failed. So why are we going to do any of these things? Look, it's it would have been used by a lot of the the detractors of Bitcoin that are now just like really hard coping about Bitcoin success, they would have been pointing to this saying, see, look what happened in 2017. It failed. Like, this is a scam. We got to regulate this. People are going to get hurt. So thankfully, cooler heads prevailed and the maximalist mindset prevailed in 2017 and forced the businesses to capitulate to the will of the users. And that showed how decentralized Bitcoin really was and how it really is controlled by, by the Bitcoiners and the node runners and the users and the developers. Right. So so the to relate this to now, there was that was a really tough time for a lot of uh, bitcoiners and it and it hardened a lot of bitcoiners in their philosophies and in their hatred against all these other distractions and in their disdain for like the investors that were backing Segwit2x coin and ICOs and people like Vitalik and, and and all the investors and all these altcoins and ICOs who are just sitting there eating popcorn, watching Bitcoin get forked. And actually people like Vitalik who were supporting Bitcoin Cash and Roger Ver tweeting out congratulations to, to him and, and Jihan on their successful attack of Bitcoin. I mean, that really <laughs> that that really caused some like PTSD that I think is showing up now, even still right. in the fact that how vitriolic some Bitcoin Twitter people can be. And right. they just, as soon as you mention an altcoin or something, you're just a dirty, sh no, no good shit coiner or whatever. Right. It's like, it's still PTSD from this. And I kind of understand why, because look at what all the investors and VCs and altcoiners did. They just stood by and watched as, as Bitcoin was like going through this traumatic experience and they were betting on the other side. That's this the way that we look at it anyways. Yeah, it, it's such an important piece of history. I know that there are people uh, now who are in the space, many Real Vision subscribers uh, who came into it not for philosophical reasons, but as an investment, came into Bitcoin as an investment. And they're just baffled by why there's so much emotion around this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rao, for example, says all the time, like, I just I don't understand why are people so upset? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an investor in Bitcoin. I invest in some other things. I think of it as just a portfolio of investments. I go a little bit further out in the risk curve uh, with some of the more altcoins, uh, but I'm still core in Bitcoin. And I think it's such an important story for people to understand the context, the history of how we got to where we are today. Uh, and it's just such an important story to get told. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, there's a book that came out recently, BitMEX put out a book on this, and um, I'm blanking the name of it, but maybe we can throw it in the show notes or something when it's like the block size debate or something like that. I can't remember, but they just wrote a whole book on this and it's been getting really good reviews online. Uh, it seems to be really fairly balanced. It's not just a one sided take. It, it explains the perspective of all the different parties. So if people are really interested in deep, diving deep on this, it's called the block size war. Yeah, the block size war. I think the reaction to people <clears throat> coming in and then like doing what Raul Paul did, which is be a really vocal proponent for Bitcoin, talk really positively to Bitcoin, uh, two story, a different class of investors about Bitcoin and bring in this whole different group of high net worth individuals and traditional finance folks who are just managing their own portfolios. Maybe they're managing for family offices. Uh, right. Maybe they're just like millennials who got like a hundred thousand dollars and they just want to not lose it in a stock crash, whatever it is. It's a whole different mindset of people who have like a really, um, I guess, good alignment to Bitcoin, if they really got Bitcoin, they would they would really get it as a digital gold thing. So we saw we saw this and we were all cheering on Real Vision for a long time. 
And then I think it's the PTSD of what happened in 2017 when Raul starts to say, look, I'm warming up to Ripple. It's like, oh, my God, not him, too. Like we thought we thought you were the chosen one. <laughs> but it, it, it clearly it kind of show it triggers a lot of Bitcoiners because it then shows us that, like, OK, maybe Raul doesn't really understand this the way that we do. And, and he's just in this for the trade. And he says that all the time. It's not like he's been dishonest about it. He, he clearly said for a year or two years that this is the best macro trade opportunity I've seen in a while. Best risk return ratio on on this trade I've seen forever. It's the best uh, macro like trade out there. So he, he always frames it in that perspective of it's a trade for him and it's it's a, an investment. But I think that's really the, the crux of it is that right. Bitcoiners are not just in this for a trade. Right. We, we really are in this to change money and and to solve a, a serious problem that affects a lot of people in the world and a lot of this altcoin crypto stuff is just like it's like penny stocks or or junk bonds or commodities or something like that it's it's just not as important and bitcoiners are just frustrated that the 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 people the new people that are coming in are getting confused and getting we think bad information about what's really going on and what these asset classes really are, because it's not, it's not Bitcoin and crypto it's Bitcoin. And then there's everything else is kind of like a separate asset class. Right. Um, that, that's really the way that we look at it. So when people say buy some, you know, Bitcoin and ETH, those are the same sort of thing. Get exposure to crypto through Bitcoin and ETH. It's just like, it just shows that you really don't understand what, why we're in this and why this thing is important. Right. It's not, ju it's not just a trade or an investment. It's literally like trying to solve a pretty serious problem in the world. Well, you know, I, you know, obviously I, I work with Raul. I know him quite well. And I know that he has real genuine respect and admiration uh, for the Bitcoin community, for what's been done uh, by and in the Bitcoin community. I just think that like, this is really hard stuff, Brad. This is not like intuitive. And I think for people who aren't in the space uh, full time, who weren't in the space in 2017, that sometimes these are just really difficult concepts to grasp. And for people who have traditional investment backgrounds, for people who don't have computer science backgrounds, for people who are, you know, worked at hedge funds for 20 years and they see this and they get excited. And I don't think it's just about, look, the price action obviously is a tremendous draw. That's the headline. That's the thing that pulls everyone into the space initially who wasn't, you know, perhaps part of the ideological movement very early on. That headline number, what happens to price action is a huge deal. But I think for those of us who are, and I even consider myself relatively new to the space uh, compared to the OGs who have been here, uh, who were in the trenches uh, for a long time, you know, it's just an overwhelming amount of information to try and understand. And for people who have traditional investing backgrounds, I think they often look at it like, well, yeah, I'm a, you know, Bitcoin is my largest holding, hypothetically, right? But like, I'm also interested in, in speculating on some other things as well. And I really like and genuinely admire the Bitcoin community. And I like the thing that they're doing there. And I like the way that they think about the world. I like the idea that they want to uh, empower individuals, you know, but at the same time, that's not going to stop me from investing uh, in other, in other assets. Look, I own, uh, I own, you know, a portfolio of stocks. Maybe I own 15 stocks, hypothetically. Why can't I own five or six different uh, why can't I own five or six different digital assets? Yeah, I think that goes back to kind of what we said earlier about uh, like the 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 I guess the way that things were back in the earlier days when there was all, the first alt season in 2013 14. Um, it was more like there was there was a lot more camaraderie. It was a lot more fun. Uh, Dogecoin had come out at that time, and I know a lot of Bitcoiners were just like buying Dogecoin, mining Dogecoin, just having fun with the much wow, very decentralized meme. It was really fun back then, and even the altcoins. It was like we kind of had some fun. Of course, there was like a group of Bitcoiners who were really just against any kind of altcoin, and even myself, I was I was like kind of entertaining the idea that oh yeah maybe there could be a meme coin like like dogecoin that that could be like number two to bitcoin or yeah litecoin is the silver to bitcoin's gold sure whatever it's a faster version it has a silver logo let's do it but <laughs> that as the block size debate raged on and then we saw the vcs come in and invest in all these like projects with all this really scammy marketing and and really trying to like attack bitcoin's narrative uh or use case where Circle and Coinbase and and all these companies were trying to like take away the store of or sorry take away the method of exchange use case with their stablecoin products. 
and then use see on seeing all these uh vcs backing these these coins that were trying to take away bitcoin store value properties and then push all these false narratives about bitcoin is uh, ossified so that means it's not changing um bitcoin can't do smart contracts so that means it's going to miss out on the quadrillion dollars of derivatives volume or all these whatever pick your narrative that's what we're most frustrated with is that the new people that come in like you mentioned that don't have this background are getting misinformation they're getting pitched this this like story of you know bitcoin's great but look at this one it's it's private or look at this one it does nfts so buy this one and it's 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 a disservice i think for for people to learn about altcoins as if they have a fundamental value that's the same as bitcoin and i'm not against people trading penny stocks i mean i'm not against people doing forex or binary options or investing in uh, bronze or whatever they want to invest in it's not against that i th- I think it's more so that we're very frustrated to see like the millions of new people that are coming to Bitcoin this cycle search. How do I buy Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? And you can look at the Google search trends and you can see DeFi, NFTs, crypto, Dogecoin, any of these search terms compared to Bitcoin just pale in comparison. Bitcoin dominates everything. Bitcoin dominates the search terms. Bitcoin dominates transaction volume. If you look at anybody that's doing any kind of real world usage of peer to peer cash, it's Bitcoin. It's not any altcoin. Stable coins are growing in volume, but Bitcoin still dominates. If you look at like all the numbers that the, the merchants put out, um, the payment processing companies, it's, it's 70, 80% Bitcoin. And then stable coins are a second. And then it's maybe a couple altcoins like ETH and uh, Monero. So you look at that, you look at the amount of people using DeFi. It's tiny. Look at the amount of people using NFTs. It's tiny. It, like you can actually go to DeFi Pulse and DAP Radar and look at the numbers on this stuff. And you can see, look at Etherscan if you want to check out DeFi um, liquidity pools and DeFi protocols. For the amount of press that these things are getting, it's totally ridiculous compared to the amount of users. Now, the amount of money going into this is different. This is the same as 2017. The, the, the whales are making their bets on, these, on this narrative that crypto is the future and everything's going digital and the network effects and all Metcalf's law. And, and like, so buy this shit coin. Look how much volume it's doing. But literally, you go look at the Ether scan and you can see how many people are interacting with these contracts. It's in the tens of thousands compared to Bitcoin, which is in the hundreds of millions. Well, 150 or so million people on the, in the world own Bitcoin. So it, it's like we get pretty frustrated because all these VCs and influencers and, and educators and stuff that should be doing more education on Bitcoin. And they kind of don't talk about this bearish sort of negative side of it, which is a lot of froth, a lot of FOMO, and, and a lot of, um, it's, it's almost like dis, uh, distraction from, don't look at actually how many people are using this, just look at the total amount of volume. That's what you want to look at. And I really don't think that there's enough critical coverage of these things because we are in an alt season, we're in a bull market, there's a ton of froth in this market. So yes, it's gonna dominate headlines and stuff, especially for companies that are making money on subscribers and ad views and sponsorships and stuff like that. They wanna talk about what people are you know, buying and what's going up in price because it attracts people. But we, I really think this is just a repeat of 2017 and I don't think there's anything fundamentally valuable being built in the crypto space besides Bitcoin. I think all this stuff is going to go down not another 96% again once this bubble pops. But because we're in this environment where the Federal Reserve is encouraging people to just take extra risk, they're printing trillions of dollars, they're keeping interest rates low, everything's going up. Houses going up, stocks are going up, Pokemon cards are going up, sports cards, sneakers are going up, everything's going up. I bet you those books in the background are going up. You probably sell your books for a two or three X right now. People are just putting their, their their dirty fiat money, which is going down in value into anything else that's not fiat. And that includes <laughs> cryptocurrencies. So it's like all this education is being done about why, um, why Aave is so important for decentralized lending or why Uniswap is such a br- groundbreaking technology for decentralized exchange. It's the future of securities exchanges or whatever. 
and I, I really think it's a bunch of nonsense because there's 40,000 people using Uniswap. It's this exact same people that were using Bittrex and, and Binance in 2017. It's the exact same pools of people that were trading ICOs that are trading NFTs. So it's not like this new groundbreaking thing that's, I think, going to have long-term fundamental value. I think Bitcoin is the thing. Bitcoin is the thing that's going to have the continued Lindy effect. And right now we're in a crazy bubble that's going to end up popping just like pot stocks or, or anything else, like just like crypto last time. So that's where it's frustrating. It's not like we're against new technology. It's just that the v investment thesis for, for driving people into buying altcoins, I feel, is going to end up get, getting people wrecked just like just like it happened in 2014 and happened in 2017. It's probably going to happen again in a year or six months or whenever this, this altcoin party ends. Bitcoin's going to be the thing that retains its value. And is I don't think any other cryptocurrency is going to end up becoming like a competitor to gold as a as a reserve asset for uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds or something like that. You're not going to see a sovereign wealth fund put ETH or like Uniswap coin on their balance sheet. So so that's really I think where it comes from. It's just we're just super frustrated to see like we learn nothing in the bull market in the bear market from from 2018 and 19. It's like oh yeah I guess all this stuff can have value again. Uh, Let's do it. Let's let's go for it because the price is going up. And I realize I'm starting to sound a little bit like Mike Green here. So I'm gonna <laughs> you know, I we've barely scratched the surface of this debate, but I think this is such an important piece for Real Vision uh to hear this view, for you to bring your institutional knowledge, perspective, history uh to this, to give people a sense and a context of what this debate is all about uh and how the Bitcoiners see the world. I think this is incredibly value and I, valuable uh, for our subscribers. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. But before we go, uh, what are your final thoughts uh, that you'd like to impart to people uh, who maybe have just heard this side of the argument for the first time and are interested in hearing more? Okay, so if it's Real Vision Crypto, most of the people that are probably subscribed to this are of the mindset that they're just, they got tons of altcoins and they're probably trying to look for the next gem. <laughs> and um, I would say... Don't sleep on Bitcoin. Don't sleep on the Lightning Network. Don't believe all the narratives that are being pushed on YouTube. And don't believe that people, like people are just trying to sell you their altcoin and just try to give you excuses for why this is better than Bitcoin. And literally that's what's happening. I see so many people commenting to me on Twitter and, and stuff that are in, in crypto, just totally misunderstanding Bitcoin and not getting what makes Bitcoin valuable. And, and they're they're pushing all these false narratives like Bitcoin can't scale, Bitcoin can't be is only store of value, Bitcoin can't do anything, it's boring, Bitcoin's a boomer coin. Like I, I, I just I just would hate to see people um, suffer through a 95% correction to be this early in finding Bitcoin and then lose their money in altcoins holding it through a bear market. So I would say listen to more Bitcoin education stuff. Like come on Clubhouse and come into the Bitcoin rooms. Come on to Cafe Bitcoin on Clubhouse. If you need a Clubhouse invite, like reach out to me on Twitter um, at Brad Mills Can there, and I'll send you an invite. And just educate yourself more on Bitcoin and and don't don't be too overexposed to the altcoins. Sure, if you want to take some speculative plays and you want to try to 10x your your position or whatever in a bull market, go for it. Just um, learn more about Bitcoin. Just dedicate some of your learning resources towards Bitcoin and learning why it's valuable. Check out uh, Preston Pish's podcast is an amazing resource. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to have you back. And I'm going to try and convince you at some point to switch seats with me uh, and interview someone else on this topic, because I think it's a really important conversation for us to have. Uh, it's definitely one that I think it's important for us to have at Real Vision. Brad, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ash. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.